So as we begin this panel discussion, uh, a reminder of context for the questions and the discussions. Um, the title of this session was or is Interfaith Dialogue as a Religious Principle. And uh, it may be a reasonable expectation that that general topic could be a guide star for questions and discussions given the three presentations we've just heard. Um, in addition to that, as the moderator, I would invite you as participants, as you would ask questions, to uh, ask clarifying questions of our panelists regarding their presentations and use as much care as you possibly can when under pressure with a microphone and, and it's being recorded and I think I just probably excluded half of the people that may have been prone to ask a question, but that's where we're at. So, um, but please use care to craft questions as concisely as you possibly can. Um, we're interested in exchange, but we are particularly interested in also in that spirit of exchange, hearing the ideas and thinking of our panelists this morning. And, uh, and so in the context of our panel, and in that mixture of conciseness and clarification, I think we'll have a nice blend and discussion. And so with that in mind, uh, there is a lot of different questions that you could pose. And so I will throw the floor open. Microphones will be brought to you. Please get the mic as close, close to your speaking voice as you possibly can so that it can be recorded clearly. Okay. Is there a website you can go to look at Islamic religion and philosophies and all, all nine yards? Um, yeah, is there I a think website? It's, hard to, it's hard to endorse one website uh, in particular, but if you look at Harvard has a very robust pluralism project that's run by Diana Eck. And they have some excellent case studies of interreligious cooperation uh, that I would recommend. Uh, but I think one thing to keep in mind, there are many websites that utilize the word Islam but are actually designed uh, around misinformation or very shallow or shoddy scholarship of the religion. So when you are looking for websites on Islam, it's important to know who's the source behind the website. As it is with any religious tradition, it can seem as if it's emanating from legitimate sources. But uh, if you're looking for interfaith cooperation examples, that might be one you could check out, the Pluralism Project. Can you please write that down? Sure, sure. I appreciate it. Okay. Uh, Dr. Saeed Miller, first, uh, thank you for coming uh, to address us. I know for me personally, it was a privilege to listen um, to your speech. I was wondering if you could speak to um, the prevalence of a kind of liberation theology that might uh, exist within Islam, one that is concerned more with orthopraxy rather than orthodoxy. Mm -hmm. um, and to the extent that there is one, um, I was thinking that perhaps the four points that you mentioned uh, towards the end of your speech might be one way in which it can be very inclusive with people of other faiths, which might be important in various um, uh, you know, liberation struggles that are occurring? I think, uh, I think we'd first have to define liberation theology. Some, um, I think what I can speak a little to is that uh, I spoke a little bit about the notion of justice, of adl, in, the, in Islamic texts. One of the things that I've done in my writing is also to highlight elements of interreligious dialogue that also pay attention to the notion of mercy or rahma. And in fact, in the Quran, there are many, many different forms of mercy, 
of um, redemption, of approach both to the divine as well as to other individuals for when there has been a transgression. And unfortunately, uh, that element is often not mentioned as we discuss uh, relationships within our tradition and across traditions. And the foundation of those conversations are on about, I would say, are on, on four or five pillars. In Islam, we like to use the word pillars. I guess Mormons have spires, I'm not sure. But we, <laughs> we use pillars. Um, and I think of those elements, I, I would articulate them in three different ways, four, four different ways. One of them is the idea of humility within Islam is, is really emphasized in our text on a regular basis. And uh, humility is, in fact, I think we talked about early on the creation story of Iblis. His sin was not necessarily a transgression only against God, but it was the notion of him having within his heart an element that didn't have humility and respect for this new creation of man uh, of, in Adam and Hawa, we call her Eve. Yeah, so the notion of humility is very important. Uh, the other idea that we talk about a lot and forget within Islam, the element of anger, both at the social engagement level as well as at the beyond the pers intrapersonal communication is, is viewed in a way um, that is so, it's so profound in practice and uh, I actually have <laughs> been, I'm going to be teaching a course specifically on the notion of anger both from a historical perspective as well as an individual perspective. So I'll just give you an example that, um, for instance, the Quran says that uh, those who give in times of both plenty and in hardship and hold in check their anger and pardon their fellow men because God loves the doers of good. So the idea of pardoning and withholding anger is actually, that's uh, from the Quran, um, Ayah, I speak in Arabic, I apologize, chapter 3, verse 134, and there are many sayings of the Prophet. One of them is that the showing of might is not through our, is not through dominating others, but it's by withholding our anger. So redefining strength in response to situations that we face, both from a notion of justice, but also a notion of mercy. Last of all, I just wanted to mention that when we engage with people of other faith, the rules of engagement are just as important as the substance about which we speak from a Muslim perspective. So the Quran also says, do not argue with the people of the book, except that in a most kindly manner, unless it is that some of them are bent on evil doing. Say we believe in that which has been bestowed upon us from on high upon us, as well as that which has been, been bestowed upon you, for our God and your God is one and the same, and it is unto him that we all surrender ourselves. That's um, the Quran, uh, chapter 29, verse 46. And I will end with one last thing. One of the responses that we think of to injustice is certainly action, um, but it is also the notion, the Quran says two things, sabr, patience, and marhama, compassion. So um, that's from uh, chapter 90, verse 17. I return to the text because that's another very important um, element of discussing any notion in engaging with the Muslim community. The importance of text is very, is very uh, paramount in our discussion. And I get concerned often when I see speakers that are not familiar with text and rely rather um, on a very shallow interpretation that concerns me. So those are some of the things I'm writing about and thinking about these days. Um, I, I want to just follow up on this. It's maybe a question to you. I'm not sure. But on, t on your question, it seems to me liberation theology in the Christian context is a reaction to two things. One is overemphasis on doctrine, which you mentioned with going to praxis and pra praxi. And the other is uh, overemphasis on the other world. So that liberation theology seems to me a corrective where it says, look, if you look at the Gospel of Luke, for example, there's all this concern about the poor in this world, the kingdom of God, etc. And the kingdom of God is not just an otherworldly phenomenon. And it seems that's the trick with liberation theology in Islam, is that neither of those two, two problems is there. And so the reaction to them that would produce liberation theology isn't necessarily there either, in the sense that the tradition is not hyper 
focused as, say, Protestant Christianity it has traditionally been on doctrine, nor is it so focused on the other world that the story, that, that this is kind of an antechamber or dress rehearsal for the, for the next world. Do you think that that's, that that's frames the liberation theology question or not? I mean, I think we could have a whole conference on the notion of liberation theology. And I'll mention in, in a piece that I'm writing right now, one of the things that we, one of the dynamics in interreligious education that we have to pay attention to is a recasting of the Christian taxonomy of theology and doctrine into an Islamic, um, into an Islamic uh, vein. What I mean to say is, when we engage in conversation, most institutions are based on a Christian understanding, not just of Christianity, but of religion. So the notion of liberation theology emanates out of an ethos uh, that we can't always find a parallel for, even in language amongst uh, the different faiths. So I, I preface my remarks with that. There are some who would say that the Islam itself uh, has liberative elements to it, that the prophet's call was one that came to those that were the most, um, the most marginalized in society. As we know, for the first 10 years of his, again, call, which is another Christian, Christian <laughs> phrase, uh, he fo the people that, that people that responded to his tradition were not, that, were not the elite. There's a beautiful uh, ayah in the Quran um, about Abasa wa Tawalla. It's a beautiful surah that talks about a blind man. The prophet was speaking with wealthy chiefs uh, in his community. And he, a blind man came and said, I, I have something to say. And he turned and just mildly frowned. And this revelation came down saying that someone came to you and you didn't give him your full attention. So the notion of within Islam, the measurement of influence in society should not be wealth, it should not only be political power, it should also be ethical and moral power. So one might see that message in a way that has elements to it that are liberative, but whether one would construct a theology that is liberation oriented as a parallel to that which we see in the last 50 years here in the United States uh, and abroad, I think I think that we would really have to engage in that conversation. I wanted to mention also one other thing that's really important. Uh, often we are focused on Islam as a cultural phenomenon that promotes rebellion as an essential element of the existence of Muslims. That's how it's cast in, uh, unfortunately, in the popular narrative. For many of us, the rule of law within whichever state we exist is extremely important. And I think someone alluded to this earlier in this discussion, why haven't Muslims often rebelled amongst states in their own countries? And surprisingly, it finds its explanation somewhat within um, our sayings. Prophet Muhammad said that he who dislikes the order of his emir or his leader should withhold from opposition, for he who rebels against the rule, against a rule by a span, dies in a state of jahiliya. Jahiliya is a state of ignorance. So the rebel rebellion, in fact, is not inherent in many of our teachings. Obedience to the rule of law was even important in the prophet's own rhetoric and discourse. And uh, one last thing to throw in is that what was considered very uh, important is the Prophet Muhammad said, the most excellent jihad is the uttering of truth in the presence of an unjust ruler. So the most excellent of jihad or exertion or struggle was not a physical rebellion, but the speaking of truth. And that is what many of us, when I saw what happened in Tahrir Square in Egypt, to me that was, um, as that hadith or that saying of the Prophet said, the most excellent form of exertion of one's uh, duty to utter the truth in the light of an unjust ruler. I'm going to riff on that. How do I turn this thing up? And just say we all owe uh, Stephen a, uh, a, an Islamic hand for following that hadith today in his talk. I think we um, are always moved when someone comes uh, at invitation to uh, talk about uh, a religious position and to say what he or she really thinks the truth needs to be said in a community where n there might be controversy on it. I, I just really appreciated your topic today. I, I, um, it moved me that you were um, so um, caring to say what you really think in this group. 
So, Randall, if I could ask you a question in response to Stephen's comments. Um, why is it, and in your observation, maybe you will respond by saying, no, Blair, it's not. In my <laughs> observations, in my experiences, um, Mormons are, as a general swath, um, broad stroke of the brush, anxious about Islam. And um, instead of people approaching me about my travels and research and the things that I do in the Middle East and saying, what is it that you love about these people? I'm asked one question and one question consistently, most recently uh, Wednesday night. Um, and that is, how do you think the gospel will be taken to the world of Islam? So there seems to be a proselytizing model. So my question for you is, what is it that in your experience, as you've responded to and listened to Stephen's comments, in your experience in interreligious diplomacy between Mormons and Muslims, what are the, what are the primary barriers? What is it that keeps Latter-day Saints anxious? Um, hopefully I've framed that up in a way that you can run with it, but that's a question that's on my mind given Stephen's comments and you sitting right next to me as the uh, founder of the Foundation of Interreligious Diplomacy. By the way, uh, this last year we changed the name of the foundation to the Foundation for Religious Diplomacy because we literally found we were spending half our time working on intra religious issues. You can't really get into a good inter without realizing the intra is actually more difficult. So it's now just religious diplomacy. But um, William James said that um, when we face the various conflicts in the world, um, that history proves that religion will drive all other factors to the wall, that um, whether you're a Marxist in your theories and think that eco it's economics, it's all economics, it's the economy stupid, or whether you think it's uh, a social, a social theories to think that it's a matter of uh, cultural power and, and prestige and, and, you know, James wouldn't reduce anything to anything in his work, but he did say you can observe that that which people, um, will do that will put their lives on the line for a, a non-economic reasons that would uh, literally sacrifice their families um, and that which they hold much dear for an otherworldly goal um, is extremely powerful. Mormons get that. They get that. They have, they've been raised, you know, if you got into a Mormon psyche, you'll give it all. In fact, when polygamy was finally put down, um, a, a group of Mormon leaders, B.H. Roberts being the most um, well-known, uh, privately said, we could have held out so much longer. We would have been on reservations. We would have been down there next to the Indians. We would have shown people what faith is all about. There's that element in Mormonism. And then there was the young kids that, that in those times I studied this as part of my dissertation who said, oh, we can't wait to get this polygamy thing off our backs. We just want to be normal. We want our friends to like us. We want to fit in. Okay. This was back in, in the early, uh, late 1800s, early 1900s in the Mormon people. I'm, I'm actually going to your point. <laughs> Mormons see on one level themselves in Islam. They understand what this could mean if the Muslims started to feel like this is the only true church. Nothing in this world really matters but this. And if they do it for the wrong religion and jihad comes in and, you know, it, it scares them to death because they can see how another person like they might put it all on the line for their religion. You see, and so it's that psychological possibility that Mormons see in themselves. My great-great-grandfather uh, was part of the Martin, uh, the, the uh, you know, it was John D. Lee. He slit the throats of w women and children at the Mountain Meadows Massacre, okay? 
uh, that's, he did it very wrongly, okay? It was murder. But I'm sure as I read his diaries that he was telling himself something else. He was telling himself something else. And so I think there's that element, that Mormons understand real commitment in another person. And, whoa, what if it goes the wrong way? You know, we're in trouble. We're back to the wall. I think there's this two other elements here that we understand. Um, and one, um, I, I just wanted to, to, to say that we spend a lot of time protecting God. People who really believe in God spend a lot of time protecting God. They want God to look good. And, of course, God looks good if your religion, which represents God, looks good. And so you're willing to do all sorts of cover-ups in order to protect God and to make sure people out there get just the good impression of God. Because, after all, salvation is important. And, and uh, you know, sure, everyone's got weaknesses, but our and our religion has weaknesses, but we don't want to show that because that shows that maybe these atheist guys are right. You know, maybe there isn't a a God out there. So there's, I think, a deep level of um, uh, um, ambivalence in most religious people where they want to be transparent, fully honest, and yet they also want to, it's, I don't think it's a matter of personal pride. I think it's really this idea of they want to, they're responsible somehow to represent the truth in as most compelling a way as possible because that is the most important thing in the world. I'll just stop there. But I'll, I, but, and I would say that Mormons have a problem, in, with respect to your question, of allowing any other religion to look as good as theirs, their religion, not because of pride, but be, they're worried about confusion. People might get confused to think that Islam is equivalent to Mormonism. It isn't. Mormonism is the truth. Islam has got a lot of truth, but it is not the truth. And that is the way I think most people who hold these, and I, I could have said X religion. You could, you could fill in the blank for a lot of religions. It is the truth, and we don't want to confuse people by saying it isn't. And so when you, when you see another religion that's coming forth and really maintaining its truth claims with fervor, it's a problem. It, you want to be buddies, but at the same time, you don't want to let them confuse the world by showing the world that your religion is less somehow. Hey, I wanted to respond to that comment. I think one of my major concerns in multi-faith dialogue, I was involved with a major dialogue between evangelical Christians and Muslims in Texas, and many who come to this work make the assumption that what you have to check at the door are your interests in proselytizing or evangelizing one's own faith with the other. While I myself do not have that posture in my work, I do not, that's, that's not the purpose for me in, in intra-religious uh, encounters, I think it is intellectually dishonest for us to have a litmus test to say that to engage in these multi-faith settings, you must check your beliefs at the door. And that is also a legitimate fear for those that have an, a strong sense of adherence to their faith I think uh, if we ask them to do that, then it makes our discussions uh, kind of, either they don't come to the table, or it does what I call out-nicing each other. We're not really honest, and we sit there trying to compliment one another and ourselves in a self-congratulatory manner. And the Quran says for Muslims that one of the signs of God is that we are made into difference so that we may know one another. And unfortunately, many of the commentaries explain knowing one another as if it's just very simple. It's a difficult thing to really know one another. And the active form of that verb in Arabic, it's, a, it's an action. It's a, it's a complex relationship. So I, I, do, I am very concerned about this notion of a litmus test to engage with one another, that you have to, you have to think and be a reflection of my own attitude before I will engage with you. So I wanted to say that we needed to be much more open to that. And I have to just offer one self-critical remark. One of the difficulties and one of the great uh, elements uh, that also can create dialogue between Mormons and Muslims is the international experience that Mormon youth have in their mission uh, trips. I've never, learned, I've never met people that spoke languages so quickly. I wish I could learn Arabic as quickly as many of the young people that study, 
there, that study other languages. Um, that's from a pedagogical standpoint, it's fascinating to me. However, if you look at the Cairo Declaration on Human Rights um, that was uh, adopted by the Organization of Islamic States, many scholars have been critical about how minor religious minorities are treated in Muslim-majority countries. So I think we have an ability to talk about that international experience because many Mormons have that international experience. But as Muslims, we also have to talk about if we want to have a free market of ideas and religions, it has to be two-way. So we have to defend the rights of those who are minorities to be able to share their faith as well. So I, I just, we need to speak about that openly. I don't want to gloss over that. And I think it can't, we can't argue for that only for ourselves and not argue for it for those who are minorities within our both Muslim-majority nations as well as within our communities if they choose to go upon another religious path. Uh, it seems that the uh, core purposes of each of the traditions are very similar. The Quran begins by emphasizing that God is merciful and compassionate, and the four pillars talk about benevolence and mercy and compassion and wisdom. That could come right out of the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus summarizes his pillars, and it comes right out of Mormon scripture. Why is it that we can't why do we get caught up in this us versus them mentality over more superficial things rather than seeing these common elements and coming to what, what religion is really about in all of the traditions to bring us together? We can come through different roads to get there, but, but these pillars of compassion, benevolence, uh, mercy, and wisdom that each are designed to bring us to ultimately by their founders. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we have a uh, best-selling author that could possibly address this question. No, I mean, they're asking me because they know what I'm going to say. I'm going to disagree with you. I mean, I, uh, I mean, I think I'm going to respond to uh, to you and also to this idea of of interfaith dialogue and what you s what you leave at the table. You know, my impression of the history of interfaith conversations in American culture is that they began with liberals. They began with, with liberal Protestants, liberal Catholics, uh, wanting to talk to one another, and then they expanded and started to include liberal Muslims and liberal Buddhists and liberal Hindus and liberal Sikhs. And, um, and they all got together and they just talked about, they, did, they out-niced each other and they, they talked about how they really didn't fundamentally disagree. And typically they made a move that you made, which is they moved toward conversations about ethics. If you look at the kinds of declarations that come out of conferences where there's efforts to articulate, say, at a parliament of the world's religions or something, common ground, they're always going to talk about ethics. Um, why are they going to talk about ethics? Because that's the only place where there's even a, any kind of plausibility about commonality across the world's religions. It's so clear that the myths are different, the views of God are different, um, the doctrines are different, the practices are different. You know, Christians don't go on the Hajj to Mecca. They just don't do that. Um, Muslims don't believe in the Trinity. Um, and the only way to, the only way to, to create, uh, you know, what I refer to as pretend pluralism around that is to set, is to tell these believers that what they see as essential is inessential. You know, so that it, the Hajj just doesn't really matter, obviously. The Trinity doesn't really matter, obviously. Um, baptism doesn't really matter. And pretty soon you're just saying that the whole religion doesn't matter. Um, and so I think that, you know, ethics is a common ground upon which religions can build. But even in the field of ethics, I, I gave a talk uh, a couple nights ago at a Catholic college. And I, I said that, you know, I thought the, the home ground for the world's religions, the place where they converge the most is around compassion, you know. Um, but that I said that that isn't the, the mountaintop, you know, if you, one of my polemics in the book is against the idea that religions are different paths up the same mountain. And I said that I don't think compassion is at the mountaintop because it's just not that central to any of the world's religions, you know. Jesus didn't die, according to Christians, to come in the world and tell us to be nice to help la old ladies across the street. He died to address this problem of sin. 
uh, most Christians would say, to offer salvation, to take the world's sin upon himself. Um, that's, a, that's a soteriological issue. It's not an issue of, of ethics. And immediately this ethicist came up later and he started yelling at me and saying, you know, ethics is totally different across the world's religions too. It's only ignorance that makes you think it's similar. You know, when you look at the reasons why a Catholic is going to be compassionate, the reason why a Buddhist is going to be compassionate, the reason why a Muslim is going to be compassionate, it can be very different reasons. So even there we don't have much home ground. I think the way forward is not to pretend uh, that there's agreement. And I don't think the way forward is to have us check our proselytizing or our doctrines at the door, but rather to learn how to live with difference. This is something all of us have experience with. Everybody in this room knows how to get along with people who are different from themselves. We do it in our families all the time. How many of us in our marriages say, you know, isn't it great that we're exactly the same to our spouse, you know? That, that, that's the basis of our marriage. We're, we're just essentially the same. Nobody says that. It, 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 that's, that's stupid on the face of it. We understand that the world's economic arrangements are different. We understand that the world's political arrangements are different. Why can't we understand the world's religious arrangements are different and then figure out how to live with difference rather than starting on a basis what I think is a, a condescending falsehood and a dangerous one that somehow the religions are all the same. So I'm going to be a skeptic about that, and I'm going to say the, w the way forward is to uh, have us talk about our differences, figure out a way to, uh, to live with them, and then maybe even come to respect and appreciate them, and that that's the, that's the way ahead. Uh, I couldn't, I, 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 can I just move this over? Okay. I have to say I, I agree completely with what was just said. Um, does that work? Yeah. Uh, John Gottman, you are may be familiar with his work. He's overturned the world of marriage therapy in the last 20 years by observing uh, long-term successful marriages. And he determined in those marriages, 67% of the conflicts are never resolved. Successful long-term couples learn to re-engage the same conflicts in a periodic, respectful way. They don't avoid the conflicts completely, nor do they harangue each other about them every day, but they have ways of, oh yes, here we are again, and instead of, oh yes, here we are again, you idiot, it's, oh yes, here we are again. And the idea is, uh, and these are very subtle things, but I couldn't, I, marriage is a great metaphor for what we're trying to do internationally now. We are on a planet. We are married. We're not going to, that's a given. No divorce is possible. So how are we going to do this? I think um, one way is to do as Gottman does in his therapy. Look at people and say, you realize it's okay to disagree deeply about very important things. What's not okay, he's, he calls it the four horsemen, but and the biggest horseman against uh, any success in marriage, guess what it is? It's contempt. It's the opposite of respect. He can show, he sees couples, he's actually filmed them, and when their contempt muscles, which are shown in the face, start to show, they can be very nice to each other, being nice, nice, nice words, but he predicts, and is always right, 98% of the time, they will divorce. He can show a couple that's having an argument, but when the contempt muscles are not being observed during the argument, he says that one's going to make it because they have an undergirding respect for each other. And it's that, that so uh, the way forward is to find in dialogue that moment where you see in your opponent something that you trust and that is the commitment that they have to the wrong idea the love they have in spite of being wrong, the willingness to be disciplined in their lives and, and live their lives as good, well as possible, even though they are duped by a false religion. It's that <clears throat> moment of human um, respect that will change our, our world. And, and, and so we can't just live with each other. We have to learn how to engage each other and continue to resist. I, I, I just, uh, I remember when I was trying to talk to m some of my Mormon friends and leaders about 
what our project is. I sent them uh, a, a short paper, and they called me back and said, we can't publish it. There was a typo in it. You said uh, right at the beginning um, that you wanted uh, an organization that simultaneously promoted cooperation and co-resistance. You meant coexistence. And I said, no, 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 that, that was not a typo. Cooperation and co-resistance together, that's the way forward. This is for Stephen. Oh, no, no, I, I, I want to say something real quick on this too. Before, and then I'd love to hear. Is this still? This is still working, right? Um, uh, my colleague Adam Seligman at Boston University has a book called Ritual and Its Consequences, and he makes this sim very similar point about ritual that we often think about ritual as kind of fixing stuff. That's why we keep repeating, going back to it that this is this way we fix, we fix conflict inside a community. And he, he makes the opposite point. He says ritual is the way that we keep conflict sort of just, we, we articulate the conflicts that we have with one another through ritual and that that's what keeps us moving through. And, and so, I, I, so I may be redirecting here and almost asking my own question, but when I heard both of you speak, you, you, both, uh, you both mostly talked about ideas, but you both have all this wonderful experience of actually dealing with actual humans about this stuff. And it seems to me that beyond the theories about difference and similarity, whatever, that it seems like the rubber really hits the road is when people are doing stuff with each other, right? When we have these, these folks you were talking with at The Hague and when we have these folks you've been training for how to, how to talk with one another. Uh, I'd like to hear from both of you about how kind of, r now ritual either in the big capital R sense or in the small sense of just isn't, isn't this the place, the activities we do with one another? We had a woman talking with me about you know, baking bread and a, a that as a kind of place where humans can come together. Isn't that, isn't that the place to be hopeful here? Sure. I think, you know, I tell my students that I consider interreligious dialogue successful when two people sit down and acknowledge that they believe the other person is going to hell in the afterlife. <laughs> but, and, let's not use the word but, yeah, yeah. and they're able to work with one another to alleviate the major conflicts of the time. So whether if in your city it's poverty, whether if in your city it is homelessness. In Islam, we have an incredible sense of, of uh, obligation for charity, not just zakat, which is the mandatory charity, similar to those that are from uh, tithing with Mormons, although our percentage is not as high as yours. So that might be one of the benefits to add there. Two and a half percent versus 10, you know. So, but we have the notion of charity. So I think, I think that that's really important. I wanted to just share with you uh, a couple of frameworks that I, uh, as, that I use to hang my, not hat, my scarf on for, uh, for the work that I do. One of them is we have often seen the notion of intergroup um, identity work or uh, conversation based on a common enemy. And more and more social psychologists are thinking of uh, what Patinsky calls allophilia, that it is possible to have a supererogatory identity that creates a common interest in action that is not based on a common enemy. So more and more in my work, that is what I look for. What is the supererogatory, the, the framework upon which this group can work towards uh, some commonality on while keeping in mind their intentional, deliberate differences. The last thing uh, I wanted to say in response to this, and I really, I'd like to hear your questions because I learn more from the questions that I hear from others, um, is this notion of that comes out of uh, Northern Ireland. It's the, the work that we need to do in our own communities. It's called single identity work. What happened in Northern Ireland is there was so much focus on bringing people together across communities. And what we forgot is that within our own, sub, within our own subgroups, there are agents for violence that perpetuate the violence. And often the victims, in the case of terrorism, more than 80% of the victims right now are Muslim. I mean, it's, 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 it's not... It's, it's, it's an internal conversation that's most difficult to have. So sometimes as I do interfaith dialogue, I think, well, maybe the Christians need to speak with the Christians. Maybe, you know, maybe the Muslims need to engage more with Muslims. And s the genealogy of inter-religious dialogue is very similar, um, I think, to what Stephen has outlined. And often it's people who don't feel comfortable in their own communities that are 
most interested in dialogue with other communities because they're outsiders within those communities. And that's, that's okay, but I, I recently was doing a, a conversation with New Zealand Christians. I don't know how I, you know, I don't know where I end up in this world. And they said, you know, we're beginning to feel that a lot of people think in a postmodern setting that interfaith is a religion unto itself. Does that make sense? So I, I think we have to understand that dynamic and uh, begin to think about how we frame these conversations because the notion of interfaith, when I work with evangelical Christians, they say, no, I want to use the word multi-faith. When I work with the Muslim, you know, uh, Jewish dialogue, the idea of is more interreligious. Every community resonates with that terminology in very different ways. So even before we begin to move into a conversation, how we frame that conversation alienates and also creates affinities with others. So think about how you're framing the conversation as well. Thank you. Nate Oman. Stephen, I don't know if this is working. Yeah, put it right close. Okay. So um, on the one hand, you know, religion is often criticized for overreaching in the public square, for imposing its morality and sometimes its doctrine on the political process or um, anything like that. But on the other hand, it's often criticized for not being sufficiently activist in you know, promoting social justice. It's not involved enough. What are your thoughts about um, religion developing a workable, sustainable, consistent um, approach to involvement in the public square that can satisfy both of those poles? Um, I think one of the most interesting things about religion and politics in America is the fact that by design, this conflict has never been solved. If you, you go back and you look at what was going on in debates with the founders and what happened with the Constitution and with the Bill of Rights, that we decided to have an ambiguous situation that was going to employ a lot of energy in the Supreme Court for, for centuries to come. Because we, we did not strictly separate church and state, and um, we did not entirely entangle them. So. There's always this dance between you know, how closely they can be tied. And I think that's also be, then presents a difficulty for your question, I think, was more about inside a community, what can we do? I think that presents problems that you, you're never quite sure what's exactly appropriate. You know, I, I, you know my, my feeling is, is that uh, I don't have that much patience for my friends in Cambridge and San Francisco who uh, are just always opposed when r religious people are out there doing stuff, you know. Um, and of course they're not opposed when Martin Luther King is out there doing stuff. They're just opposed when, you know, right-wing people are out there doing th the wrong stuff, like when the wrong religious people are out there doing the wrong political stuff. So I don't know that I have much advice except for that, that, the, th that kind of dance between engagement and disengagement is always is fluid and I think there is actually a lot of space legally in America for um, engagement of religious groups you know um, and the Supreme Court is always doing I mean one example is the so-called you know three reindeer rule that they have for nativity scenes in, in municipal public spaces I don't know if you're familiar with this but you know if you put a nativity scene up in a public space and it says it's just Jesus and Mary and Joseph, and it says John 3.16 or something. Uh, that's unconstitutional, pretty clearly unconstitutional. But you have that exact same thing, even with John 3.16, and you add some Santa Clauses and some candy canes and then three or four reindeer, then you're good to go because now it's kind of sufficiently ambiguously secular meeting religious. So I guess I'm just empathizing. I didn't answer your question. I'm just empathizing with the problem. I, on, that, on that point, I think uh, I'd, I'd like to say that Roger Williams um, is really, as Martha Nussbaum calls him, the first founder. Um, he saw that um, the lively experiment that he called uh, America was to create a polity uh, where the foundations for that polity 
were constantly and perpetually in contestation. Where the foundation for your unity is always a part of the argument. And so it became um, part of our, I think, our culture uh, to have this tension between church and state in the public square because we have an undergirding tension over why we have the, the, the order itself of our civilization. Is it based on God? Is it based on rights that we've made up as human beings? What is it? And so I, I really think that um, when I see people elevating the question of whether church arguments belong in the public square, underneath, I, I think psychologically, I applaud it. At least we're aware. <laughs> At least we're bringing into the public mm -hmm. consciousness that there's an argument over who's in charge here. Your God, my God, your texts, my texts. Um, and I think... And, you know, I would add to that, um, I would add to that in, in, in a somewhat prescriptive vein, that... I do think that part of the responsibility for people who want to go into the public space for religious reasons is to articulate what they're doing, both in terms of their religion and in terms of American uh, secular values. And I think that's what the most like that's what Martin Luther King. If you look at his letter from Birmingham Jail, and you just go through and you look at the sources that he's using there, he's using scriptural sources. He's using sources from Jewish contemporary Jewish thinkers. He's using sources from Hebrew Bible prophets, but he's also appealing to the Declaration of Independence, to the Constitution, to the First Amendment, to the Gettysburg Address, to Lincoln. Um, and I think that's, that's, to me, is the most successful way to do it, is to, is to be able to be sort of bilingual while you're doing it, so that you're not, you're not betraying your own tradition by pretending that you're doing what you're doing for purely secular reasons, but you're also not, you're also showing respect to American secular traditions by, by referencing the, the, the so-called common values that we have that are always being contested in, in, uh, in the public space. We are, unfortunately, out of time. And in the uh, tradition of religious studies conferences at UVU, we are uh, on the brink of another session. We do not believe in lunch. And uh, as a general idea, we will plow through it. And, uh, but this is where, as Randy Paul explained, you grab people, you tackle them, you, you take them back to the, uh, the soft seats back there and have a conversation. Uh, bear in mind, if you uh, take a Mormon as a Muslim to Haram es Sharif, or if as a Mormon you take a Muslim to Temple Square, you will find three major head-on collisions. Uh, no prophet beyond Muhammad. Mormons have Joseph Smith. No scripture beyond the Quran. Mormons then have the Book of Mormon. And the divinity of the divine sonship or the divine sonship of Jesus Christ. These are significant core issues. Also sanctity, the sanctity of, of space. Uh, mosques generally non-believers are able to engage in that space but the sanctity of the Kaaba and Mecca so that is also terrible. thank you yeah. We have our temples. yeah exactly That's yeah we have the well, concept that was my point. yeah, yeah. That there is and so the principal point is when you're on the brink of having that uh, experience and you're wondering what are some readings I might engage in here are three authors and uh, scholars that you could profitably um, turn to uh, as a starting point. And so on behalf of uh, Utah Valley University, we thank you. Please join me in a round of applause for our three presenters.